Um, welcome everybody. We're thrilled you're here to talk about one of the most important topics in education today, which is social and emotional learning. I'm thrilled to introduce my probably my favorite author team of all time, Jessica and John Hannigan. Uh, Dr. Jessica Hannigan is an assistant professor in the Educational Leadership Department at Cal State Fresno. She is an expert on all things behavior, including RTI, MTSS, PBIS, SEL, and much more. She's also a, a fantastic consultant and trainer. Uh, John Hannigan, Dr. John, is also, he's an executive leadership coach for Fresno County Superintendent of Schools in California. He has been in education for over 15 years. He's been a principal, an assistant principal, instructional coach, and also a teacher. Um, I can't even name all the awards that his school won when he was a principal. Um, everything you could think of, he got. Uh, we are thrilled to have him as, as an author. He is also an expert on all things behavior. And their latest publication with Corwin is what they will be discussing today which is SEL from a distance. Welcome Jessica and John, and thank you for being with us. And I'll turn it over to you. Welcome everyone. Thanks for having us. Thank you for the introduction, Jessica. You know it's recorded, so it's gonna go to your other authors. <laughs> We're totally fine with that. <laughs> so, hi, my name is Jessica Hannigan. And I'm John Hannigan. Welcome to SEL from a distance. Why SEL now more than ever? A couple logistics before we get started. We have our Twitter handles here and our Facebook group, Equity in School Discipline, Hannigan Group. We love having our colleagues follow and share and collaborate together. So that's a way you could contact us even after this uh, short webinar if there's anything you ever need. One more logistic item. We have a bit.ly. So if you want to take a picture of this bit.ly to keep, this bit.ly will be open beyond this uh, webinar. This is designed for you to have access to some of our most popular resources aligned with SEL from a distance. So if you put in bit.ly forward slash SEL FAD, you're going to find some resources in there. One thing that you're going to find that may be helpful today just to help keep you organized is we're uh, going through an entire book in a short time. So give you some key components um, is our graphic organizer. So if you want to go to that bit.ly, again, it's on the bottom left here and download this form and save it. You could type into it and it'll help keep you uh, organized as you're following along. You could also use it with your own staff as you continue this work uh, beyond the webinar. All right, so we'd just like to start off really quick with this uh, this little quote, and it, it really got me thinking. Those of you guys that were around uh, the late 90s, early 2000s in education, it, this pandemic has done, I think, to SEL what No Child Left Behind did for English learner development in the early 2000s, so bear with me here. So when, as a, as a former fifth grade teacher, you know, the model was, you know, the students would go to the language lab to receive their, their daily minutes of ELD instruction. And so I guess my point was, it was someone else's job. We would send those students to receive those services. In pre-pandemic, I, I, we saw that becoming something with SEL. The counselor would pull Arthur from class on Tuesdays and Thursdays from 1 to 1.30. It was, it was someone else's responsibility. But now, when I think back to ELD, when No Child Left Behind came, and we all know the AYP with those subgroups, we saw that, uh, that the EL subgroup was, uh, what, with the services we were providing was, was a great disc service. Those gaps were significant and servicing them in the traditional way was not gonna work. And so we had to change the way that we served our English learners. And so what NCLB and AYP did through compliance to, uh, to, to, to shine that light on the services we needed for our, our English learners. I see this pandemic doing for SEL that I don't think now when we come back, whether it's virtual hybrid, face-to-face, -face, that, that, that SEL is gonna be a block of time or you know, it's gotta be in my lesson plan books showing that 30 minutes of SEL, it's gonna be something that, that, that we're gonna be weaving into 
um, academic skills as well as social behaviors as well. So current state, whether we are in virtual hybrid or back face to face, don't let uh, the title SEL from a distance fool you into thinking that uh, it's just for remote learning. These are going to be tools that we're going to share with you that apply in any setting. And so we're going to introduce some of the SEL competencies, deconstruct those into skills, and we're going to provide some tools to show you how we can then teach students, uh, you know, the behaviors that we would like to see. And so, so it still fits whether it's in a virtual space or face to face. So pre-pandemic, we knew our kids were hurting. This, this is research prior to COVID-19. One in five children being diagnosed with a mental health problem. 43% increase in ADHD, 37% increase in teen depression nationwide, 100% increase in suicide rates in students 10 to 14 years old, and uh, increase of students that have had traumatic experiences. We know the importance of uh, trauma-informed practices and that's that plays a role in that as well now during covid this is some of the most recent research that has come out seven out of ten students struggling with mental health in some way now more than half experiencing anxiety 45 percent excessive stress um, 43 percent struggling with depression and 61 percent reporting loneliness there is actually even research on early college, late high school, so 17 to 19, 20 year olds, 25% reported um, having suicidal thoughts. So with this pandemic, we know our kids are hurting. So again, whether it's virtual hybrid or face-to-face, -face, when students that were on our radar pre-pandemic are still on our radar, but we also know that there's gonna be students that weren't on our radar that will need to be. And so we're gonna provide some tools on how to identify these students and give them the supports that they need. Here goes back to uh, Teacher School 101. So we know this one, uh, Maslow's hierarchy, but I just wanna point this out because this where, where all of these supports fit, obviously beyond you know, the basic needs of oxygen, water, um, those physiological needs, the first one up from there is safety, physical safety, emotional safety. So you saw that slide with trauma-informed practices, students having adverse childhood experiences, that's where that fits. Students need to feel that emotional safety, um, physical safety in order to, you know, progress through this pyramid. So then when you see those connections, we always hear we need to make connections, engagement, students don't feel connected. That's relationship and love. Above that is uh, self-esteem. And that's where you're going to see a lot of these SEL skills coming to be with that self-respect, the um, uh, empathy, a lot of those things are in there. So of course, in order to, to reach the, the highest, which is creativity and problem solving. So don't worry, this isn't a trauma-informed practices uh, presentation, but I do want to point out, and this comes from, uh, if you haven't read Help for Billy from Heather Forbes, it's a fantastic resource. But instead of looking through the lens of a student that's, who's behaving bad or behaving good, seeing it through that lens of regulated or dysregulated. And so we know that students that are have those adverse childhood experiences that they're developing, their brain is developing into a brain that's wired for survival. So when we see a student who is defiant on the surface, it looks like defiance, it's a student who's in a dysregulated state of fight or flight. And so that's where, if this is that student's breaking point, that one which seems like a completely innocent command from me as the teacher, sends that student into a breaking point where they disrupt the class, flip a chair, or uh, you know, stop um, showing into our Zoom sessions altogether. And so when we talk about dysregulated, we're talking about hyperarousal and hypoarousal. And that's the brain's fight or flight. And so hyperarousal would be fight. So pre-pandemic, when we were all face-to-face, -face, all the principals in the room, teachers, you know, those behaviors that you were seeing were those, those social behaviors, disruptive behaviors. Now we're seeing it hypo arousal, that uh, tardy, they're not logging on, absent, shutting down, avoiding tasks, not turning in their work. Hypo arousal, that's flight. So what we're seeing is still the brain's same physiological response to toxic stress. It's just showing itself in a different way. 
Okay, in addition to the why that John has shared, and a lot of the why he shared has been the impact on mental health on our students, um, there's also an impact on uh, a, a lower level of academic engagement. So compared to their engagement levels prior to COVID-19 closures, uh, many students' current levels of engagement are much lower and somewhat lower, according to their teachers in, a latest, in this latest poll, and this poll has stayed pretty current. Uh, I know the number one need when John and I are working with schools, when we talk to the teachers and admin, is student engagement. And um, when you break down student engagement, it really encompasses SEL skills that our students need. In addition to that, what percentage of our students are essentially truant? So MIA not logging in on, um, not logging in at all, not making contact with you. On average, it's one out of four students. And if you kind of look at the number of students you serve in your school and you make that calculation, one out of four students are in this range of either MIA not logging in and not making contact, that's really scary. Um, and those are some of the students that need us the, the most. So what can we do to address that through integrating SEL is what we really need to think about, especially when we have access to them. And sometimes we have one or two shots to earn their trust and respect. So we already were experiencing these gaps in academic and social behaviors. We were experiencing these pre-COVID as John said. So can you just imagine now? Students are coming back to us with these greater gaps in social and emotional needs than before. Some students who may have not even been on your radar are showing different kind of needs with SEL. And um, this, this has made it really clear that we need to integrate SEL in what we do, not only for our students, but also for our educators. And we need to model what we're asking our teachers to do for our students, creating that safe, welcome, predictable environment for our teachers and staff as well. So what is SEL? There's a lot of different definitions of SEL, but for John and I, we like to be on the same page with exactly how we're defining something so that we're really clear when we're working with our schools that we have a common definition. And that's really important for you all too as you're messaging to your staff what SEL really means. Simply put, one of our favorite definitions from Castle.org, which is um, an organization that has been researching the science behind SEL for 30 plus years, is uh, the relationship, the inner relationship between emotions and behaviors and vice versa. And ultimately, it's the ability for students to be able to understand their emotions and behaviors and how they impact each other and have a set of tools within their own toolkit inside to recognize these emotions and behaviors and to apply these learned skills, not just for school, but in real, in real life. And so some of those skills inc include self-monitoring, self-regulation, self-image, self, um, so self-imagery, and that all impacts their access to their learning. To break that down even further, Castle.org has done such an amazing job in identifying five core SEL competencies that are critical for any student and uh, any adult, in fact. And the five are relationship skills, responsible decision making, social awareness, self management, and self awareness. What we did in this book, because not everybody went to school to you know, to learn how to teach some of these, what's referred to as soft skills. What we wanted to do is take the best practices from the schools we work with and figure out how we could integrate SEL in very practical, doable ways. So for every SEL competency, if you could see on the right, it's deconstructed into smaller components of what a school or what a student needs to demonstrate to master that competency. So you could see for relationship skills, if you break that down, communication, social engagement, relationship building, teamwork, that all sounds great, but how the heck do we teach it? And most importantly, how do we know if the students are actually gaining anything from our teaching and applying it to life and um, generalizing in, in multiple settings beyond just school? 
and I won't go through the other ones, but we're going to give you some samples of, of a few of these. And so Oops, just sorry, really John. quick, <clears throat> what we also wanted to do was, was make it something practical that we have to be able to deconstruct it into a skill that we can teach. And so think of it in terms of if I'm a grade level team and uh, the common core standard of numbers and operations, I can't just teach students numbers and operations. It's a very broad, very big, wide ranging um, standard. And so, but what we can do is break numbers and operations into things like multiplying fractions that can be then a skill that I can isolate and teach. And so that's where, when we say deconstructed, think of it in the same sense of what we do for our academic content. We don't just teach numbers and operations, we have to deconstruct it into a skill that we can teach. So I know that uh, there's a lot of behavior initiatives taking place throughout the globe, really. But we we did an exhaustive, this was probably harder than our dissertations put together. Mm -hmm. Like we literally went through each behavior initiative and covered everything until it reached a saturation point and started hearing, you know, the 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 practitioners that were at the forefront and what each and that's what we did with uh, with building behavior. What brought and don't and this isn't a plug for building behavior people, but stay with me. So but what what it did for us as as coaching schools what we would hear was, yeah, we don't really do PBIS anymore. We're more of a restorative justice school or, you know, in like 2010 to 12, PBIS was the thing to do. And then in 2014 to 16, restorative justice was the thing to do. 18 to 2020 was trauma-informed practices. And now, obviously, with all the civil unrest in our country, you know that culturally responsive teaching is at the forefront so it, it just it made us think like why would why would i implement something then abandon it and search for the next thing all of these i think we can agree have a home on our campuses that we need a tiered system of behavioral supports yes that, that students need to be taught explicitly what's expected in every setting but also knowing just like i talked about regulations that's the dysregulated or regulated state that if i have a student who's dysregulated to get that emotional safety so that they know you're loved, I want you in my classroom, that they can get to a regulated state, and that we know that students are going to screw up, and when they do, that we use that as an opportunity to repair the harm. Would we agree that that would be an important skill? And of course, culturally responsive teaching with student voice being uh, critical, um, developing students with that critical lens of injustices, setting high expectations, and then character ed, where you know, giving back that that civic learning, um, having those service learning that we are part of a community, and then of course the SEL competencies that Jess went through. So these things aren't in competition with each other. We don't run out for the next shiny object and abandon one. If we've already implemented an initiative, start weaving in other research-based best practices. Because I'll tell you what, this is it. There are only six. <laughs> There's not a seventh one lingering out there. And so whether you have like a second step curriculum, that still fits into SEL. So any things that are out there, they still fit into these broader initiatives. And so we just wanted to highlight that because this isn't now one more thing to do or another initiative. In fact, we would argue that all five of those competencies, each of these skills, you can connect to any of these six. And so, again, I know that when we're implementing something, we're doing it obviously in the name of supports for kids, but sometimes in communicating that, the teachers see it as, oh, here we go. Here comes the, here comes the next new thing that we're gonna run out and implement. That's not what this is, and that's not what any of those six should be either. Just wanted to call that out. And then here's the last little thing here. When initiatives fail, it will be traced back to any of these five things right here. And this is what we call the systemic behavior gap. And when we say behavior gap, this time we're talking about adult behaviors. Initiatives fail because lack of uh, communication, collaboration, coordination, capacity building, and collective ownership. So bear with me as I'm, as I'm reading some of these, uh, these thoughts out, I want, I want you to make those connections because I'm sure everyone on here can relate at some point to any of these examples or have your own example. So that lack of communication would be if, if, if I put a student into a tier two intervention, but I don't, I don't tell my teacher team why, how, or monitor the implementation effectiveness, 
I don't have that transparent dialogue. Teachers aren't going to own that lack of collaboration. So if I'm not even in addition to that, um, gathering evidence or input from the teacher teams prior to designing and assigning an intervention for a student, well, then the interventions are just going to be given to the classroom teacher by the behavior specialist without their input. So they're not, it's going to feel like a compliant task instead of a support tool for the student. Now, lack of coordination, who takes the lead on this? What are each member's uh, roles and responsibilities? So that resource alignment is, is critical as well. Then capacity building. If I have a, 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 I'm a teacher, I receive a student on a, let's say a check-in, check-out intervention um, for repeated minor misbehaviors in my class, but I don't understand how to implement the intervention within my classroom other than filling out their goal sheet and then sending them to the office at the end of the day, which obviously isn't check-in, check-out. But the lack of that capacity building, I've, we've seen where initiatives fail, it's because of that lack. And so then the last one is collective ownership. So if I have a student receiving, let's say a tier three um, behavior intervention on a, or a student on a special ed uh, behavior support plan, yet now I don't have that, that collective ownership, like it's my responsibility also to support the student on this intervention, that then when the student escalates, then I'm just gonna call the school psychologist and say, come get Billy, he's, uh, he's escalating. So I just wanted to, and I'm sure you guys were all able to connect with any of those, but that previous slide on why initiatives fail and why we'll implement this one for two years and run off to the next, it's not the initiative that failed that can be traced back to any of those five. The reason we like pointing that out is because it's gonna really help you think about your messaging and if this is a priority not or not to implement at your site. So we started off with the why and gave you multiple reasons of the why. Then we shared with you the common definition that we utilize to help make sure our integration of SEL is aligned and everybody's on the same page. And so um, we wanted to just point that caution out because even pre-COVID, there was a lot of schools struggling with behavior SEL implementation and it was due to those factors. So can you just imagine now even trying to do it from a distance or as you're, you know, coming back to uh, being in person, just be aware of those areas and keep a pulse on them to make sure that everybody's really clear on this work. That's the only way you're going to get the, the impact of your entire school being on the same page or your classroom. So where do you begin? Uh, there's a lot. There's a lot to this. Um, there's a lot going on, but we also need to practice the SEL skills of adaptability and prioritizing. And so when we're working with our schools, we, we try to narrow it, narrow it down to these two questions as we're beginning to have that dialogue and kind of seeing what SEL skills that they're noticing their kids need. Okay, so the first thing we ask is what are these challenging behaviors you are seeing? And um, of course it was, what are, you know, what are these challenging behaviors from a distance that you're seeing? And then the second column is what SEL skills the student lacking. So as you could imagine, the challenging behavior list was really easy to fill up. So um, we kind of call it a therapy session. Everybody share out, you know, what are you struggling with? And that's really, really easy. Well, the second column's a little bit more difficult. And so let me give you a filled out example from uh, one of our schools and see if any of these behaviors uh, look familiar to you. So um, this school listed apathy, lack of engagement, silent, some disruption, lack of focus, shutting down, lack of motivation, giving up easily. Uh, I'm just listing a few. And then we had to walk them through, okay, so maybe apathy could be a student having some areas of social awareness that they're struggling with. Maybe lack of engagement, maybe some self-discipline skills that those students don't have. And maybe this wasn't a problem when they were in person and they had that constant redirection from a teacher or teachers. And now they're in a spot where they have to find that self-discipline to you know, stay on task, um, not get overwhelmed, ask for help when they need. Um, shutting down maybe a student having some troubles identifying their emotions or also knowing how to process some of the emotions that they're feeling right now with the civil unrest 
throughout the nation and just the impact of the pandemic, there are some emotions that ad us adults don't know how to manage at times. So can you imagine our students? So there may be some areas um, of focus there that will help with that. Uh, giving up easily could be self-efficacy. So just want to give you some examples of taking those challenging behaviors and trying to convert them instead of a challenging behavior to an actual SEL skill or skills we think our students need. And so connecting this to academics, we're really good at when we have a non-fluent reader that we can say it's because the student hasn't mastered vowel blends and digraphs. We give them a double dose of vowel blends and digraphs, extra time, support, intensity, get them back on track reading fluently. So this applies the same, yet when we see students that have these challenging behaviors in the left-hand column, it's like, that's it, I'm done. We need to, you know, we, this, I, I need to kick this student out of my Zoom class or send him to the office on a referral. We still need to identify, though, the students demonstrating these behaviors because they're lacking a specific skill. Whether it's an academic or social behavior, the student's still lacking a specific skill. And so that's what this process is going to do is connect those behaviors to the skills that students are lacking and give you the tools to support them. So here's the teaching process. So this is just an overview because we only have a, a short period of time with y'all. And so we want to, we want to be able to identify. So what, what is that skill that a student's lacking? What SEL competencies are necessary for that student's success? We want to then teach explicitly and planning out coordinated effort, whether it's with a specific grade level or a department or a school wide model those skills through different um, different modalities as well. So, so we want to give scenarios, uh, you know, role play, let students come up with uh, ways, right way, wrong way, different ways to show students what those expected behaviors are. And then we want to systematically spiral those skills in over over periods of time as well. And with the model component there, it's really important that also as the, uh, the adults we're modeling those behaviors that we want our students to demonstrate as well. So those SEL skills and specifically relationship skills, communication, things like that, that we want our students to be able to do, we also need to intentionally practice and make sure that we're humanizing their experience um, with us, whether it's virtual or in person or hybrid. So I just want to make note, we work with schools where we delve deeper into the actual SEL teaching process and develop, you know, um, ways that this integration is going to happen. And ultimately, we provided you those practical tools that that make it easy for you to start thinking about this integration of SEL. Sometimes people get scared of SEL because they didn't go to school to be a psychologist or a counselor. That's okay. You could teach these SEL skills without having that expertise. Now that doesn't mean you can't lean and you should lean on the people that went to school for that, especially for those more intensive tiers of support because that's what they went to school for. But, but we can all teach these basic life skills together. We do it with our kids and family members every day. And so we just want to show you how and we want to um, make it easy. So what we did is we took our most popular um, and tried and tested tools and processes for how you teach each of these components uh, for the five SEL competencies. So there's 60 plus tools and processes in this book for you that you could take and use tomorrow uh, based on the area that your child, a group of students, your school is demonstrating a need for. We wanted to highlight two areas that are really important right now and just given our time, just kind of give you a, a, a little example of what these tools and processes look like relationship skills and self-management. And so, like I told you before, relationship skills um, can be deconstructed into communication, social engagement, relationship building, and teamwork. Well, what we did is we provided you those resources for how to teach communication. 
social engagement, relationship building, and teamwork. And then once you do it, you'll, you'll see how this integration is not something you do at only Monday from 9 a.m. to 9.30, that it becomes a way of being for you. It becomes just embedded into your classroom. Okay, so if you see here the definition of a relationship skills, the ability to establish and maintain healthy and re rewarding relationships with diverse individuals and groups. We thought this was critical during this time and um, an important focus for a lot of kids. So the ability to communicate clearly, listen well, cooperate, um, negotiate conflict, seek help, um, help seeking behavior. These are very important. I wanna also note the communication goes um, both ways and the relationship goes both ways. So uh, giving our students opportunity to establish relationships with peers, but also with their teachers and um, school staff is critical. So um, here's just one way. Uh, we're just showing you a few of some of our favorite tools and processes. You could see up here, we've broken it up into, you know, it's relationship skills. This is one example of how you could teach relationship building. Um, and then we have the page number for you, just in case you have the book. So this is the getting to know me exercise. And in every one of our tools and processes, there is secret psychology behind each of these activities to help, um, help get the students to think about and start practicing these SEL skills. And to be honest, also you, get you thinking about how you're incorporating these SEL skills into your classroom. So you could see here, the top's kind of the, a little bit more fun, your name, love to do for fun, strongest trait, best teacher and why. You're starting to kind of get to kind of fill out, you know, what the student <laughs> is like. But then down here, these are all SEL components, learning style preference, learning style non-preference, future goals, goal setting is so huge when it comes to motivation. So helping students goal set short term and long term and teaching them how to self monitor those mini wins is critical. So you even knowing what their goals are is so important and then helps when I'm upset or overwhelmed. So this is a high schooler, hug my baby Yoda or listen to music and read. So really starting to think about how your students regulate um, and and um, calm themselves down if they are feeling upset. So there's different ways you could do this. As the teacher, you could do this yourself to kind of humanize you as their teacher and establish that relationship. You could have the students create their slide and share it out whole class. You could share it out small group. You could do one-on-one -on -one or mini meetings just to get to know your students. Um, the critical thing here is you don't just do it at the beginning of the semester when it's like the first week you get to know each other. This kind of thing needs to be embedded throughout because students change, we change, and it's important to acknowledge these changes. Um, so thinking of ways that you could incorporate these throughout, not just, you know, at the beginning of the year. And so also flipping this into a, also a, a solutions lens. So what are the things that you guys are seeing? What are my teachers complaining to me about most as a principal? You know, if it's inappropriate text, texting in the chat box or those things, that's a skill that's lacking. And so mm -hmm. I, I know I hear it all the time too. Well, it's my job to teach math. It's the parent's job to teach them how to act. But consider they spend 40% um, percent of their awake life with us. And so they're coming to us with their parents best effort at developing those skills within them so if they don't have those skills it is up to us and i mean this pandemic's kind of shown us even having uh two teenagers in our home like holy smokes how did you not how did you not know that like things like what i'll get to next so like how to even send your teacher an email and so uh here's one where just just letting students know that italics can come across as being condescending. Um, bold and caps can come across as being, you know, feeling like you're being yelled at. And then another modality could be students come up with some other ways that text can be misinterpreted. They can develop right way, wrong way. So it's not teachers feeling like they're constantly having to come up with things. The other is how to email your teacher. I hear a lot uh, at a middle school I was working in, uh, that, that their, their subject line was the entire text of the email. Mm -hmm. So things like that where if students don't know how 
how to send it appropriately an email, they need to be taught. And so uh, I, I gave the example of uh, our, she's now 19 going to college. She was gonna take a zero on an assignment because she didn't want to email the teacher on Tuesday for the assignment that was due on Wednesday for some clarifying questions. Turns out she was on the right track, but we were like, sit down, email your teacher. It's not that big of a deal. But she was like, it's fine. I'll just get a zero. I won't turn it in. And it's like, what? It's so, I mean, these are, I mean, all, all our kids are dealing with this stuff. Okay. So we just gave you a few, there's tons in there that you could explore. Um, but we wanted to make sure that they were intentional, but easy to implement. So although they may seem simple at, at the surface, they require some uh, more in-depth ap application um, and uh, ongoing work with your students. Uh, another one that didn't make the book, it, it came right after, but I put it in the bit.ly for you, really popular. And again, this one could fall into a lot of different skills, but a part of relationship skills is teamwork. So the behavior streak sheet was motivated after um, John and I watched The Social Dilemma, which I highly recommend if you haven't. It'll change you. You have to watch it. Anyway, um, simply put, this is the power of positive interactions over time. So these students uh, really are reinforced by connecting with another friend or a group of friends over time. So they get this streak for connecting with another friend or a group of friends. When they don't connect, they get this hourglass kind of warning. And, um, it, and this is exactly copied from Snapchat, like it's their visuals, so the students get it. Anyway, the cool thing here is that the hourglass will just trigger, um, uh, trigger a chat with the teacher, or if this is a school-wide streak, that you're trying to do or a class wide streak, it'll trigger a conversation with the classrooms to help figure out what skill do we need to practice to meet our goal. And after five days of the streak, the class could earn an incentive. This, there could be a school wide incentive, there could be an individual student incentive, and you could tweak this as you see fit. So this example is one of our schools that used uh, logging in on time for the classroom to just help with teamwork. So what could we all do to make sure we're logging in on time? And um, what they decided is they wanted to earn a free homework pass if they made their five day streak. Just very powerful, easy to do, and um, will help you with the reinforcement piece too. Yeah, we even know, know a friend that has uh, like a Pilates studio <laughs> and reached out like, hey, I wanna use that with, uh, with the people that, that come in for, for Pilates. So the next one is uh, self-management. So this one, students' uh, ability to regulate their emotions, thoughts, behavior in different situations. So managing stress, impulse control, self-discipline, self-motivation, goal setting. And so again, for each deconstructed skill, dozens and dozens of tools uh, that go along with each of them. But I know we only have you for a short time. So I'm just going to show uh, one. This, this, uh, this was kind of the image a few few weeks ago, or actually it was like, actually it was between November, December, right between Thanksgiving, our, our weeks were pretty stacked. So going into Sunday, looking at the week ahead, I felt like that little guy on the right over there. And so that's where even some of these tools, they work for us as well. So I actually had to put this self-monitoring form in place for myself where I put the week's tasks um, it, based on priority and started, started crossing them off as I tackled it. But this came to be from a school we're working with where the, the team was saying, man, our kids aren't turning in the work. Our kids aren't, I'm sure a lot of us are dealing with the same thing at our schools as well. Uh, you know, they went from 80% all the way down to like 50% of my kids are turning in the work now. So, well, let's put something in place, monitor it to see what the results of that are. And so that's where we want to implement something, set a goal for ourselves as far as we want it to get back up to 70%. I'm just making this up, but as a team agree on it. But when we look at each of the, cause I know Jess had talked about kind of the science, the social science, but the, the thinking behind each of these tools. So when we see, I completed it on time, they're able to self-monitor. I completed it late or I didn't complete it at all. So when we hear about metacognition is also an SEL skill, well, how the heck do you teach a student metacognition? Well, in these parentheses, explain what strategy helped you complete it on time. Now you're forcing that student to retrieve what were those strategies that helped you so that they know that they have the tools in order to uh, stay on task. This could be used as goal setting. This could be used as accountability. You, this thing's like five and one. 
Another resource in self-management is the self-motivation check. So this is a good way to, with your uh, classroom, with an individual student, with yourself if you need it, to take a little check on um, how motivated you're feeling. That's another top area that we hear is that kids aren't motivated. And so again, each of these statements, these I statements are, are statements that we need to turn into actions to help improve our motivation. So taking a pulse, having students self-monitor their motivation and working on maybe certain areas that they need help with to help them with that is, is really powerful as well. You could put this up on a screen. You could do a whole class motivation check. You could do a one-on-one -on -one with a student just to kind of get a game plan of, okay, what do we need to do to get you from A to B, even if it's shorter chunks, like shorter goals. Um, so this has been really powerful as well. Um, recognizing where you're at with your emotions is, is very critical to starting the work and applying those SEL skills. Another example of goal setting is um, the prioritizing sheet here that we have, and you could tweak it as you see fit. But again, sometimes we forget that the skill of prioritizing and understanding, you know, what are we going to do first? How much time is that going to take? How much mental energy is that going to take? What am I going to start with first? What am I going to do when I'm overwhelmed? What am I going to do when things are distracting me is huge. So really getting students to think about the little things they could start tomorrow key moves the next um, it could be three to six months and then big plays and then the next column is visual visual visualize a target which by the way is another secret psychology trick that's imagery it's helping students see you know what two things that they need to accomplish and um, two things that they need to avoid what by what date and the goal. So you could see the example below. This was just a common one. So we used it as a sample little things logging in on time all week. So accomplish waking up 10 minutes earlier using my phone alarm and going to bed earlier. Avoid staying up all night playing video games or staying up all night watching TikToks and then setting that goal. And uh, most importantly, having um, that time to self monitor so teachers not just helping with the goal setting but really carving out that time to help um, us learn the habit of monitoring those goals and adjusting if something's not working two more just quick tools and um just so you know in the book just because they're in a certain competency section doesn't mean you can't pull them and use them to help build on another competency section um, this one is just powerful because this is the prevention piece. This is the really thinking about what it is that we want our students to demonstrate and being really clear with that common language and um, and being really clear with ourselves of what we need to teach them then if that's what we're expecting. So a lot of um, educators are good in writing what they're expecting or creating matrix. Um, for the school or their classroom, but the part that's difficult is you need to teach these items and you need to make sure the students understand that that's the expectation. One way of doing that that's really popular, um, that's been really helpful, and you could do this in person, hybrid or virtual. I still do this in my college courses with my college students so they have voice. Uh, this is the idea that you're getting students to actually have voice now. So you've, you've set some clear parameters with your, whether it's your behavior team or it's what you prefer in your classroom, whatever that looks like. But now you're actually getting students to also commit, which is another SEL skill where you're getting students to contract and really think about their behaviors and make a commitment. And um, this is a tool of how you could self monitor. So students to student, students to teacher, teacher to students, everyone to the environment, just one way you could graphically organize and you could revisit this with your classroom. You could have this up at the beginning of every synchronous session. If a student's not responding, you could have a one-on-one -on -one and bring this up and have that conversation. So consider this scenario. We gave you kind of a little teaser in the short time that we had, um, but of course, uh, you know, th this work is 
is something that you need to continually work on and develop, but there's so much going on right now. So it's important to prioritize where you're going to begin. So here's the scenario that is our most common scenario in the nation. Surprise, surprise. Teachers are complaining that students are not engaged in the virtual environment. As John starts um, talking in the next slides, I want you to just think about where would you begin? Where have you begun with, uh, with helping that challenge in your schools? And so, uh, so we actually collaborated with uh, two of our dear friends and colleagues, uh, Alex Kajitani and Tom Herrick, uh, around the elements that impact um, student engagement. And it's not just some linear if this then this there's a lot of things that encompass student engagement and so what we created were the se elements get it you get you see what we did right there with the so i think if we have to say do you get it it, it defeats the kind of catchiness but side. anyway okay so uh the first one is is connected safe and welcome and so connecting even those with with these tools within that would be within the relationship skills that uh that getting to know me exercise that Jess had shared, um, even even those classroom agreements that was just on the previous one too. Uh, the second one, choice, voice, agency in their learning. Um, that would be something about like a social awareness skill, but student voice and uh, you know and and choice in, in in the way that they want to demonstrate their learning. And then the third one, connecting what they're learning to the real world. Um, so that could be also social awareness, but also strengthening that social engagement as well. Um, so. A lot of these, so if you think of, if we're doing mantras where it's like, be here, be you, be long, or you are seen, you are heard, you are loved, and then you do the, the, the classroom agreements in addition to the getting to know me, I mean, do what fits your style, your personality, but when you start introducing these things, it, it does add to that level of engagement with students, and so we even do empathy interviews where we we talk to the kids. We ask them what leads to you logging in. And so that's where a lot of these ideas have come from is from student voice. And when you deconstruct the word student engagement, these are the three critical components that comprise that word. And it's not just for students, it's also for the adults. Um, some of these other tools and processes we shared are, are also all in the book. Empathy interviews are essential and critical and you could use those not just with students but with your families as well and with your staff um, you could also use that as a tool to teach your students how to conduct empathy interviews with other peers and um, uh, stakeholders in the community so it's such an important skill and again it's all embedded in there we have this blog for you just as a reference and um, two uh, student engagement quizzes that you all can use. If this is an area that's an area for you, just wanted to give you some additional tools. Um, this could help you self-assess. There's a teacher version to see if you have these SE elements in place in your classroom. And then we have a student version. You could give the bit.ly to your students and you could see if it matches what you think you're doing in your classroom. So it's a good way to kind of reflect and really think about, okay, well, I think I'm doing all these things, but maybe your students, maybe there needs to just be different modalities and different ways that you could do it. Again, this entire article, these bit.ly's are all in that SEL bit.ly that we gave you. So as we're wrapping up, we um, wanted to give you some tools to think about um, as you're going out and doing this great work. Uh, just, just take this prompt and kind of reflect. And based on just even the limited amount of time we had, the learning from today, where would you begin? So whether it's engagement, whether it's um, a different area attendance, uh, communication, whatever it may be at your school in your in your classroom, where would you begin? So um, that's what we wrote this book for. And that's what we do our work with professional learning is we help make sure that 
you know, we're taking away kind of that overwhelm, scary feeling of doing this work. We're going beyond an SEL curriculum. We're totally fine with, um, and you should too, embedding if you have SEL curriculum um, to help you teach these skills. But ultimately, we want you to get to a place where you know if what you're doing is making an impact on your students and if they're actually mastering during these skills that we're investing in and teaching. So for example, we're not just teaching empathy or respect because it's on a, you know, it's, 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 the, April. it's the lessons for April. We are teaching that because our data uh, and that's quantitative and qualitative. So that the, uh, your teacher input is showing that that's an area those students need. And then you're coming back after your implementation uh, to see if that actually changed the narrative. And that's when you're going to start really getting impact with uh, SEL from a distance. So just a reminder for you, this graphic organizer um, was divided into define SEL, list those competencies, what is the purpose, and then different modalities to get you started. Uh, in the bit.ly below, there's tons of resources, take some time, to kind of peek at the different resources there for you. And there's some next step guides. So we have created for you a next step. If you wanna just, you know, if you're excited and you're pumped up and you wanna start right away, there's, there's some places to begin. Um, and of course, ultimately, we would love to um, work with anyone, any school or district who, who needs that support. We've, we've seen huge impact. Um, so thank you. Yeah, share, keep in touch, share your progress uh, with us on either Twitter or our Facebook group, Equity and School Discipline. Uh, there's there's a, a big community out there of educators that are uh, that are doing great things and loving to share uh, and see what you guys are doing. But we have a book to give away, right? We do, and we have a, um, a discount code up too. All right. So is it? Who's Why don't we turn it over to Olivia now, uh, marketing okay. manager for Corwin. Olivia, you're all set. Yeah, thank you all so much. And, uh, you know, thank you so much to, to Jessica and to John, and thank you to everyone who's joined us and participated today. Um, if you have any questions that didn't get answered, uh, you can send them to us at info at corwin.com, and we'll get those answered for you. Uh, before we get to the giveaway results, I just want to let you all know that you will re be receiving a follow-up email uh, within the next few days with the webinar recording and your certificate of attendance. Uh, so make sure to add info at k12.corwin.com to your safe list and uh, check your junk or spam folders if you don't see it. Uh, and now two of you will be winning a copy of the book SEL from a Distance. Uh, so we've been monitoring the chat, uh, and our winners for today are Tiffany Benedict and Anissa Rosadia. So congratulations to you both. Uh, to claim your prizes, please contact us at info at corwin.com uh, so that we can get your information. And uh, of course, if you didn't win uh, and you'd like to purchase any of Jessica and John's books, um, you can get them for 20% off and free shipping at corwin.com using the promo code webinars. And Jessica and John are also available for consulting uh, and you can contact us at info at corwin.com if you're interested. So thank you all so much for joining us and have a great day. Thank you all so much. Bye. For Appreciate you.